are kicking off our brand new series we're calling Unconditional Family. And let me tell you why I'm so excited about it. My guess is as we sit here this weekend, many of you, if you were honest, you would say that doesn't exactly describe the family that I grew up in, this idea of unconditional. You would think there is no unconditional love. There probably was no unconditional acceptance. Maybe there was no unconditional forgiveness in your family. In fact, you might say, if you want a word that more accurately describes my family, dysfunctional might be the word, right? And a dysfunctional family would be any family that's functioning the way God didn't intend it to function. It's not going the way God wanted it to go. And you would say, that, that pretty much describes my family. Um, and you would probably love nothing more than at some point in your life have the opportunity to experience what it would be like to be part of an unconditional family. Well, it's interesting. If you've been around church for a while, you know that church families can be just as dysfunctional as earthly families. In fact, I won't ask for a show of hands of how many of you have been a part of a dysfunctional church family, but this is an area where I can speak from experience because that describes the church that I grew up in. And let me just say, it wasn't a bad church. It didn't have bad people. It didn't have bad doctrine. It just didn't function the way I believe that God designed the church to function. For example, messages weren't moving. They weren't relevant. I don't remember many times where you had this anticipation that God was getting ready to show up and just do something absolutely supernatural. Relationships weren't deep. They weren't very authentic. A typical relationship at my church growing up would be two men outside after church going deep like uh, you got an extra cigarette. In those days, that's what you did at Baptist churches. That's not really politically correct anymore. Or, hey, it looks like you got a new truck. Nope, it's used. That's about as, that's about as deep as it got, right? <laughs> On top of that, we really weren't a church that cared about our community or cared about our neighbors. We didn't take care of the poor. Uh, we had no diversity. I mean, we were about as white as a loaf of bread at the church that I grew up with. Uh, there weren't many stories of life change. There weren't many stories of radical reconciliations and relationships. I mean, when people got bent out of shape with other people at my church, they didn't resolve the issue. They just changed pews. They just moved to the other side of the church. You know what I'm saying? Kind of reminds me of a joke. A guy got deserted on a, uh, an island all by himself. And finally a boat arrives and finds him and picks him up and he's in the boat and he's pulling away from the shore and the guy who's driving the boat says, it's, it's weird, you're the only guy on the island but there's three huts. Why are there three huts there? And he says, well, the one on the left, that's where I live. The one in the middle, that's where I, I, I go to church. And the one on the right, that's where I used to go to church. See, that's, that's just kind of how we are. We can't even get along with ourselves, right? My point is, uh, as a kid... Uh, church really wasn't all that great. It wasn't all that exciting because I don't believe it worked the way God intended it to work. And then before I knew it, I grew into an adult, found myself being a pastor, and without even realizing it or understanding how it happened in California, I, w I realized that I was pastoring a church just like the church that I grew up in. And I looked around one day and I thought, wow, this is like the Twilight Zone. And I'll never forget, on our one-year anniversary, we were so sure that God had called us to that church. I remember Laura and I, we were in bed, and, and we were just talking, and we, just, we were actually weeping. Like, God, we know you brought us here, and we know the church is growing, and good things are going on. But why? I mean, these are like the meanest people I've ever met in my life, right? And uh, so to get away, I needed to get away, to get away from the staff, to get away from the people, even to get away just from the buildings. I decided that I was going to attend a conference down in Southern California. It was called the, past, uh, the Purpose Driven Church Conference. Rick Warren was the pastor of the church, and when he stood up at the conference and talked about what the church could be and how God designed the church to function, I got to tell you, I was hooked, and it hit me. Wow, this, this is why I do what I do. This is what God wants to see happen. He wants to create a group of people that love one another and forgive one another and accept one another in such a way that they are set apart from any other group in society. And I'm telling you, I realized that was God's dream. And I'll be honest with you, that's my dream. That's my dream for Hope Community Church. So over the next few weeks, I want to talk about how we can become an unconditional church family. I want to talk about how we can begin to function as a church the way God designed it to function. Because I'm telling you, uh, when it works the way God designed it, it's something to behold. It's a beautiful thing. And if we can get there, here's the thing, regardless of what our earthly families have been like, we will all get to experience what it's like to be a part of an unconditional family. So over the next few weeks, we're going to look at a family value, not a family value in the sense of from a, you know, politics love to talk about family values. We're going to be looking at a church family value each week. This week, we're going to begin by talking about the power of unity, because this is what I know, whether it's an earthly family or a church family, wherever there's disunity, there's dysfunction. 
So let's talk about why unity is so important to us becoming an unconditional family. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Joshua chapter 1. And as you're turning, it's in the Old Testament. If you didn't bring your Bible, we'll put the verses up on the screen. Or you can go, if you have a smartphone, to the Get Hope app. Go to the message. You'll find all the different verses I'm going to be referring to this morning. Actually, some extra ones in there also. It's a place you can take notes and then email it to yourself. And you'll have it for a record. Joshua chapter 1. Let me just kind of bring you up to speed. The Jewish people, the Hebrew people, I'm sure you've seen the movie, right? Uh, They were enslaved in Egypt for 430 years. After 430 years, God decides that's enough, so he raises up a deliverer. His name is Moses. And Moses goes before Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no, I don't think I will. And so God says, I'll encourage you a little bit. And so God sends the ten plagues. And finally, after the tenth plague, uh, the death angel, Pharaoh tells Moses, get those people out of here. And Moses takes off. Now think about this. Historians tell us by this time, the Hebrew people have grown into a nation of about two and a half million people, slaves in Egypt. And Moses leads these two and a half million people on a backpacking expedition through the desert on their way to the promised land. It's the land that God says, I am going to give you. It is a done deal. So they set out. They get as far as the Red Sea. Of course, they can't cross the Red Sea. By this time, Pharaoh's had a change of heart. He's thinking, man, that's my workforce. Go, and he tells his army, go get them back, bring them back. And so they're standing there at the Red Sea. The, 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 the Egyptian army is approaching from the rear. And all of a sudden, Moses stretches out his staff. God opens up the Red Sea. They walk across on dry land. Now get this. They begin what was a 13-day journey by foot to the promised land. That's all it was, 13-day journey. And after 13 days, they get right up to the border. They get up to Kadesh Barnea. They can look over the Jordan. They can see this land that God has said, this is going to be your homeland. I am going to give it to you. It is a done deal. And Moses says, what we're going to do is we're going to send in 12 spies to check out the land and and see if we're going to take it or not. And so they they go in and and they check out the, the land. The spies come back and they say, wow, it certainly does flow with milk and honey. In other words, it is an incredible place. I mean, it's like Hawaii over there, right? However, there's some problems. Fortified cities, strong armies, and we even saw some giants in the land. And Moses says, thank you for the report. All in favor of going in, show of hands, two, Caleb and Joshua. All opposed, same sign, ten. And they decide not to go in. And God's like, I told you I was going to give you the land. you got to trust me. Since you don't trust me, I'm going to give you 40 years to think about it. And so they begin wandering in the desert for 40 years. When you get to Joshua chapter 1, that 40-year period is over. They're back right at the border, right at the edge of the promised land again. A whole generation has died off in the desert. Moses, their leader, has died. And now they're standing back at the border, back at the edge, looking over into the promised land, a new generation with a new leader named Joshua. That's where I want to pick up the story. Joshua chapter 1, verse 5. God lets Joshua know, as the new leader, Joshua, you can count on my presence. Look what it says, Joshua 1, verse 5. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my, Moses, my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and you will be successful. And that doesn't mean that they're going to be rich. It means that when they get there, they will find themselves in the sweet spot of God's will. And I'm just going to tell you, when you are in the sweet spot of God's will, as we're going to see this weekend, you become invincible. You begin to realize God is with you and you develop that God confidence. And you're able as a Christian to handle any challenge that comes your way. So Joshua, he steps into this role, big sandals to fill. He's filling the sandals of Moses, right? And he steps in to be their leader, to lead them into the land. But what I want you to see are the amazing things that they were able to accomplish because they were a unified group of people. Here's the first sign of unity. I'm going to give you four this weekend. You'll notice that they rallied around God and their leader without fear. Now remember, these guys have never stepped foot into the promised land. They can see over the Jordan. They can see it's right there in front of them. But see, they've they've heard stories through the grapevine. I'm sure their parents and grandparents told them stories about how when they were there 40 years earlier, they found out that the cities were fortified and the armies were strong and that there were giants in the land. But this time when these guys get to the border, brand new generation, a little friskier than the other generation, they're ready to go in. There's no doubt about it. 
I want you to notice how they respond in chapter 1, verse 16, when Joshua begins to lay out the plan about what they're going to do as they go into the land. Verse 16, they said, uh, whatever you have commanded us, Joshua, we will do. Well, that's cooperation, right? And wherever you send us, we will go. That's availability. They're saying, we are all in. We're behind you 100%. Just as we fully obeyed Moses. Now, let me just say, that may be a stretch. Because if you've read Exodus, I don't think they fully obeyed Moses. It kind of reminds me of the old bumper sticker, the older I get, the better I was. I'm not sure they really remember how they really acted under Moses. But I think they're trying to encourage Joshua. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. That's commitment. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey your words, whatever you may command them will be put to death. I'm telling you, that's loyalty. Only be strong and courageous. That's encouragement. So just in this ver- these three verses, you've got cooperation, you've got availability, you've got commitment, you've got loyalty, you've got encouragement. I just want you to know those are words that describe a unified group of people. And it's easy to make statements like that when there's really nothing on the line. But if you've read the story, you know the plot thickens. Up until now, it's all been fun and games. Nobody's had to fight. Nobody's had to take out a sword and take someone's life. Even the Jordan opened a miraculous miracle by God just so that they could walk into the land. But when they get into the land, immediately, immediately they're faced with the city of Jericho. And if you're new to church and didn't go to Sunday school, you're probably thinking, well, what's the big deal with Jericho? But if you grew up in Sunday school, what's the big deal with Jericho? The wall. The two of you that went to Sunday school, that's really cool. Remember? (laughs) Josh, you fit the battle of Jericho and the wall came. See, that, it's that wall. It's that wall. It's this big wall. And thanks to archaeologists, we know it's not really a single wall. It was a double wall. The outer wall was about 12 feet high, 6 feet thick. There was about a 12-foot space. And then there was an inner wall that was about 12 feet thick, and it was about 30 feet high. And uh, f- for us, that may not seem like a big deal. I mean, we got drones, right? But for people who basically spent their life backpacking around the desert, these aren't military people. It might as well have been the Great Wall of China, right? So they're facing this wall, and that brings us to Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. Now, the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. In other words, they had surrounded the city, and so like, let's shut the city down. No one went in, no one came out. Now, no one went out, no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with his king and his fighting men. So again, God says, look at the city. Trust me, it's a done deal. Verse 3, Joshua, he begins to give Joshua the plan for taking the city. And this is where it kind of gets to be a cool story. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. Not Noah's ark. That would have been way too heavy, way too big. This This is the ark of the covenant. You've seen that movie. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. And it's an incredible plan because it is so ridiculous. It is so ridiculous. But you know what the real problem is? Now Joshua's got to take this plan that God has given him and he's got to go back to his leaders. He's got to go back to his military commanders, the people, and explain to them how they're actually going to take the city of Jericho. Can you just imagine that conversation? Joshua says, grab your clipboards. Let me give you the the battle plan. This is how it's going to go down. First of all, we're going to get up tomorrow morning on Monday, and we're going to walk around the wall once. And the military commanders are thinking, yeah, we got to do that. we got to stake it out. we got to see what we're up against. And then we're going to get up on Tuesday and do it again. And we're going to do it again on Wednesday. And he said, we're going to march around at one time every day for six days. Now, here's the big one. On the seventh day, get a good night's rest because we got to march around seven times. By the way, if the archaeologists, those of you who are going to Israel with me in, in March, uh, the, the city of Jericho, you'll see, it, you'll see the walls, how they collapsed in on each other, on, the, on themselves, just like the Bible says it did. But it's only 14 acres. Uh, it's about the size of the Raleigh campus parking lot, right? And so uh, they marched around. He said, we're going to march around it seven times, and then as we are coming around on the last turn down the home stretch, the priests are going to blow the horns. We're going to shout, and the walls are going to collapse. Any questions? And you know these commanders are thinking, has Joshua lost? But see, here's the beauty, beautiful part of it. Even though the plan is totally illogical, you don't see any resistance. You don't read of any reluctance. Why? Why, Why was there no resistance and reluctance? Because they're unified. Plus, they're not Baptists. They're not Baptists. So, so you can pull this off with Baptists. You can do this with Baptists. Where two or three more, two or three Baptists are gathered in God's name, there are at least four opinions. So, so not with these people, right? <laughs> You don't see anybody in the tent saying, wow, this, is, this plan just stinks. Or can we at least take a survey on this? Or you know what? Joshua didn't ask my opinion. I'm not going to participate. None of that's going on. They're like, okay, we're going to walk. Sure, put on your Nikes. Let's go. By the way, 
These are not the Israelis of the 21st century. You watch the news, you look at them wrong. They will drop a bomb on your head. I love the Israelis. I mean, they just don't mess around, right? These guys, they're not fighting men. They're backpackers. They're walkers. They walked out of Egypt. They walked across the Red Sea. They walked around the desert. They walked across the Jordan. God must have thought, well, <laughs> they're good at walking. Let's go with their strengths. We'll just let them walk around the city for a while, right? And so for six days, they just walk around the city, right? They get up, walk around once, go back to camp, order some pizza, take a shower, get a good night's sleep, watch a little TV. They do it again. Six days, nothing happens. Seventh day, follow directions to AT. They walk around the city seven times. The priests blow the trumpets. The people shout. And the wall collapsed just as God said it would. But it's interesting. Do you know what the moment of truth was? And this is where we drop the ball sometimes as Christians. The moment of truth was the seventh day, the seventh time around, just before they shouted. This is where they're thinking as they're drawing in that big breath, getting ready to shout. <laughs> this is it. Either God's going to show up and it's going to be incredible, or he's not going to show up and we're going to look like idiots, right? And that's just part of the journey that we go on as Christians. It's often in that, in that midnight hour, just as the clock is ticking down, the mid, that God comes through because often he wants to say, are you trusting me? Are you relying on me? Are you walking with me? And that's the way it was with the people of Israel. But they did it just as God said, and the wall came down, and you don't read anything about them being surprised. It's interesting. Which brings me to a second sign of unity. They accepted a new plan without resistance. I mean, this is a ridiculous strategy. But they said, hey, never done it before, never heard of it before, but if this is what God wants us to do, let's just trust God and do it. Now, having said that, let me say something about our future here at Hope. I, I wish I was a phenomenal leader. I wish I could tell you what the next year or two look like. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't really know what tomorrow looks like. I hadn't even looked at my schedule yet for tomorrow, right? But this is what I do know. In the next few months, we're going to open a new campus in Apex. It's not like any campus that we've ever opened before. It's, it's outside the box. We're not actually building a church campus. We're building a community center, 110,000 square feet of basketball courts and volleyball courts and, and gyms where you can work out and, and uh, rooms where women can channel, you know, do yoga and channel evil spirits, whatever you do in those classes, never really figure that out. Uh, coffee shops, a daycare that will take care, I think, of 325 children, all designed, how can we engage with the community, build relationships, and introduce them to the life-changing message of Jesus Christ, right? And then on the weekend, it's going to be transformed into one of the most incredible 1,500-seat uh, worship centers with Kid City. And it's just going to be a phenomenal. But i got to tell you, we're going out on a limb. We've never done anything like this before. And I wish I could sit up here and tell you exactly what the results are going to be. But you know what? This is what God laid on our hearts. I remember where I was sitting and what meeting when we were talking about building a church campus. And it was as if God smacked me upside the head and said, i got a different plan. I remember right where I was. We're going to try it. We're going to try it. But see, God has been faithful enough. We trust him. We trust him. But that's just not the only thing that we're going to do. I want to show you something that's going to help us reach the triangle and change the world. And for those of you who are really into technology, you're going to say, Mike is doing something with technology unheard of. That just tells you how ridiculous this plan is. But I want you to watch this short video, and then I'm going to tell you how God has allowed us to use this to change the world. Watch the side screens. There is only one story that answers life's most essential questions and gives a lasting sense of purpose and meaning. It's the story that inspires all other stories. It's the true story that defines every one of us. This is that story. How did it all begin? Like all stories, this one begins in the beginning with the author, who is God. He spoke everything into being. With a word, galaxies appeared with stars and planets. Earth was designed for life to flourish. Everything God made was gloriously good and breathtakingly perfect. The highlight of God's creation was the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. God entrusted everything he created to his beloved children, giving just one rule. They were not to eat fruit from a specific tree. They lived in loving obedience, worshiping God as their heavenly Father, and enjoying perfect harmony with creation, each other, and God. Considering our world today, 
Its obvious perfect peace didn't last. Turmoil, war, sickness, troubles. We each have our share. What went wrong? It started when a fallen angel named Satan grew jealous of God and determined to ruin the perfection of creation. Satan took the form of a serpent and enticed Adam and Eve to question God's goodness and rebel against his one rule. In disobedience, they ate the fruit and peace unraveled, ushering in sin and death, which still plagues us today. If we are honest, we are very much like Adam and Eve. We all rebel against our Heavenly Father, making our hearts heavy with fear, guilt, and shame. Our bodies are weary with sickness, disease, and death. Earth is afflicted with storms, calamities, and disasters. Even worse, sin has separated us from God, causing a permanent divide, a miserable separation called hell. The fallout of sin has been catastrophic. It's inescapable with no way to fix it, leaving us all to wonder, is there any hope? The love that prompted God to create us also prompted Him to send a Savior who would set everything right again. As centuries passed, God shared exact details of the coming Savior's birth, life, and death. Everything in the Bible points to this rescuer. Almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to earth as God the Son to fulfill the promise. He was born miraculously, as His mother was a virgin. Just like us, Jesus grew up and experienced life on earth. But unlike us, Jesus never sinned and always obeyed the Father. When Jesus was in his 30s, he began teaching all around Israel, pointing people to God's kingdom and performing many miracles. After a few years, he was wrongly accused and sentenced to an agonizing death on a cross. Jesus lovingly gave up his perfect life as a sacrifice to pay for the sins of mankind. He died a perfect death, taking our place, the innocent for the guilty. But the grave couldn't hold Jesus. Three days later, God brought Jesus to life again. Jesus defeated sin by dying on the cross and defeated death by rising from the dead. Today, Jesus sits at God's right hand as king and judge over all creation. This is the story of rescue God has authored. He invites us, through repentance and faith, to make his story of rescue the one we trust in and live from. When we do, everything changes. And now, what will the future hold? For everyone who trusts in Jesus alone for rescue, God has promised to restore your heart and set you free from sin's hold. Because God is loving, kind, merciful, forgiving, tender-hearted, and true. God has also promised to make all things new. One day, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, forever free from sin. Everything that causes pain and sadness will be gone. God has also promised to be with us forever. The moment you trust in Jesus, your relationship with God is restored because Jesus has closed the divide sin caused. Getting to know this all-loving God starts today and continues forever. For God's story never ends. You can make God's story the foundation of your life even now by admitting your need for God's rescue, asking forgiveness for your sin, trusting in Jesus Christ alone to rescue you, following Jesus in faith from this moment on. This is God's story. Will you make it yours? That is a video that was put together by an organization called Spread Truth. I think it is one of the most complete, succinct presentations of the gospel you will ever see in your life. Now, they have made it available to Hope Community Church. We're the only church on the planet that, I get to, that gets to make this announcement this weekend. Can we put the slide up? If you go to the website or if you go to the app, if you just go to the Get Hope app and you go to the home page, the very the first thing that comes up is the story. 
you can download, you can sign up, you can get that app, and then you can send that app to any person you want to send it to. Right now, it's available in English, Portuguese, Spanish, Swahili, Russian, Korean, Arabic, and they're continuing to spread the languages with Transworld Radio. And every time you send this to someone, they've set up a dashboard for Hope Community Church, and we literally get a map of the globe, and every time somebody opens that and sees the gospel, a light will come on. And then when they send it somewhere else on the globe, a light will come on. And I just looked at the one last night from, last, uh, from the services last night, and it's already started to spread throughout the United States. But think about this. Every per person that hears this gets to see the gospel. You say, well, Mike, this, this would never work. Let me tell you a story. Spread Truth pasted this on their Facebook page. There was a young man in Kuwait who was getting ready to take his life, went to Facebook to make his final post, came across the story, responded to them and said, I, accept Jesus Christ. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Thank you. I'm telling you, you have no idea who in your life right now may be ready to see that story. And if nothing else, it may open an incredible conversation. Or you may be sitting at a coffee shop and say, man, I know you say you're a Christian and all, but really what's that all about? It's hard to share the gospel, isn't it? But you know, you can just set your phone down and say, we'll just watch this for six minutes, right? And this is what the gospel is all about. Now, this is what I'm going to challenge us to do. I want us to download it. And I want us to pick maybe five or six people, but I don't want you to just do it. Not, I want you to pray about five or six people in your contact list who you know their life could be impacted if they yielded to the gospel, what Jesus Christ has done for them. And I want you to go home, and I want you just to send it to them. And let's begin to see. Let's begin to see it move. In a couple of weeks, we'll show you where it's going across the globe and the impact that you're making here. But it fits right in with us reaching the triangle, changing the world. And I think God is going to do some absolutely amazing things. Again, we've never done anything like this before. But the bottom line is we're going to try some new stuff, and we're just moving forward on our vision of reaching the triangle, changing the world with this absolute confidence with God that he's going to bless it because he's blessed us in the past. Joshua had never seen this strategy before, but he said, let's do it. And they did it. And I'm just simple enough to believe that the same kind of thing can happen with us. And I think that's the exciting part of being a unified group of people, a unified family on the move. When you get to chapter 8, these Hebrew people, they've arrived in the city of Ai. And they're a little bit gun shy because God had given them a plan for AI and they didn't go by God's plan, so they got their butt kicked. So now they're going back for the second time. They're like, okay, let's just do it God's way. And uh, it's all to get, uh, together different strategy. Let me give you the principle and then I'll tell you what went on. They worked as a team to accomplish the objectives without, je without jealousy or competition. They just worked as a team. Now, here's the way it happened. It's an ambush plan. So Joshua takes 30,000 of his best fighting men. He says, I want you to go behind the city of AI and I want you to hide out of sight. I'm going to take some more guys. We're going to attack the city. When they see us attacking the city, they're going to come out to fight us. When they come out to fight us, Joshua says, I'm going to yell retreat, and we're going to take off and run in the opposite direction. When we run, they're going to chase us, thinking they're going to finish us off. When they chase us away from the city, you 30,000 that were hanging out, you come around, you take the city. We'll have them sandwiched in between. We will wipe them out. Great plan, great plan, great plan, great plan. But this is what I want you to remember. Some of the people would get to be with Joshua, the leader. Some of the people would have to be with other leaders. Some of the people would be in the forefront. Some of the people would be in the shadows. For some, they didn't get to pick which team they were on, and nobody would know that they were even around. In other words, they were all involved in the strategy, but not everyone got the spotlight. They were all involved, but not everybody got the glory. It doesn't seem to bother them. In fact, you don't find anybody in chapter 8 saying, I never get to be on Joshua's team. I don't know how you get in that inner circle. I, I, you know, I don't see any of that, right? They worked as a team to accomplish the objectives without jealousy or competition. And they were able to pull off the impossible because they didn't care who got the credit and they were unified. Years ago, I was watching a news conference and I was watching Ronald Reagan. That dates me a little bit. But there was this sign on this desk and I was able finally to track one down. It says this, there is no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. And I think that's probably true as a church. There's no limit to what God can do through us or what we can accomplish is if we don't care who gets the credit. Let me just say this. If you're one of those individuals who needs credit all the time and you get angry if somebody doesn't stroke you and tell you what a great job you did, you'll probably be part of the challenge around here. But if you're simply willing to do what God has gifted you to do and you're willing to play the role that God has given you to play, even sometimes in obscurity, you'll be part of the solution. But what I want you to understand is the victory of AI, it was possible because everybody was willing to do their thing, use their gift 
play their role, and that's just part of unity. Let me wrap it up. You get to chapter 10, there's one more sign of unity. Uh, the end is in sight, but they've got one more battle. It's a big battle. The five kings of the Amorites realize there's only one way to stop this Hebrew juggernaut that's just making its way through the prime. They decide, these five kings, we're going to put all of our armies together. And so they put these five armies together. They amass this huge army. I mean, it's like the empire right, from, from Star Wars. These are the really bad dudes. But this is what it says in chapter 10, verse 8. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. There it is again. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. Look at that. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So they, they take off running. And as they take off running, the Israelites go to chase them. And God says, you know what? They're tired. They're exhausted. And God sends down hailstones, huge hailstones. And it says that God killed more of the enemy soldiers with the hailstones than the Israeli army did with swords. And then as they're wiping them out, as they're finishing them off, Joshua prays the most incredible, bold prayer you've ever heard in your life. Joshua says this. He says, God, listen, we're tired. It's been a long day, but we need to finish these guys off. And it looks like, it looks like sundown is coming. So could you have the sun stand still? Could you extend the daylight so we can finish these guys off? And God made the sun stand still so they could finish the battle. Let me give you the principle. It's this, as their trust in God grew and their unity increased, they felt invincible. This is what I've learned over the years. I have learned that when you trust God and you walk by faith, I've learned that when God comes to your assistance at those critical times, you will feel invincible and you'll begin to trust him with more boldness. And as you pray bold prayers, and as you trust God, as you continue to move forward step by step, God just has a way of beginning to remove the barriers. Again, when there's unity, anything is possible. Anything is possible. It is a great story. Now, I want to wrap it up by addressing this question. How do we avoid the things that have a tendency to sow disharmony in a church, disunity, so that we can experience the power of God working through us, so we can take that first step toward becoming an unconditional family? Let me just give you three things we need to work on. First of all, let's work hard at understanding one another. It's a big church. According to our database, there's somewhere between 13 and 15,000 people that attend Hope Community Church at least twice a month. That means they think this is their church. That's a lot of people. We have a lot of diversity, a lot of variety. We come from all different backgrounds. And sometimes it's easy to misunderstand one another and jump to conclusions. You know what I've discovered about myself? I've discovered that I tend to judge people by their actions, but I want them to judge me by my intentions. And I want them to be more tolerant. Have you ever done that? Someone ever got upset with you and you said, you said what did you say? You, you should know better than that. You should know that I didn't mean it that way. What are you saying? Don't, don't judge me based on what I did. Judge me on my intentions. You should have known me better. So I think one of the things that could help us around here from being offended and throwing up walls and building barriers is just trying not to jump to conclusions as we get into new relationships and, and we begin to get into small groups and we begin to serve. Let's try to remember that things like stress, things like life experiences, things like varying backgrounds, maturity levels, all of those things impact how we act and how we react in situations. And when someone comes across wrong, why don't you just stop long enough and just think, I wonder what's going on and where are they coming from? You know, this is something that, forget church, this is something that I've learned in life. You ever been to a restaurant and you just had the most horrible service in the world? What's your natural tip idea? I'm not going to give much of a tip, not with this kind of service. But Laura and I, we began to talk about that and we actually tip the most when we get lousy service. I don't, now let me tell you why. Because I started to take the high road. I'm like, wow, I wonder what's going on in their life I don't know about. I wonder if she's got a sick kid at home and she's worried. I wonder if her and her husband just had a big argument. I wonder if she's miserably ill today, but she can't afford not to come to work. And I believe that if we would just apply that same kind of courtesy to one another within the body, instead of just writing people off, I'm not going back to that small group. I'm not serving with that person anymore. I'm not going to have a relationship with them. I think it would keep us from jumping to, to conclusions and throwing up barriers and building walls and ending relationships. You can't have unity that way. So that would be the first one. Let's work hard at understanding one another. Man, when you see somebody around here and they obviously aren't like you, what if you just had a conversation with them? So can I introduce myself to you? I've seen you here. 
would love just to get to know you. Can you imagine how that would take us toward a unified body? Here's the second one. Let's be more intentional about taking the high road and forgiving. As I've said before, forgiveness is a decision. It's not a feeling. It's an act of the will. You, you decide, hey, I'm going to release this person from their offense. I know they offended me, but I'm not going to hold on to it. I'm going to cancel the debt. And you determine that every time you're reminded of it, so you see them in the parking lot or they cut you off or his wife's wearing the same dress you're wearing, you know, you know, you know and it, Hey, I, I, I specifically remember forgiving that. And you have to let it go. You have to send it away. I'm telling you, there's nothing more important to us maintaining unity than our willingness to forgive one another, forgive one another, cancel the debt, send it away. Because I'm telling you, you get this many people crowded into these many campuses, there's going to be some offense. There's going to be some hurt feelings. But you've got to send it away. Here's the third one. Let's start giving. And I know what some of you are thinking, why, he can, he, can, he can tie money into anything, right? I'm not talking about money. You know, I should. Some of you losers need to hear that, but I'm not going to talk about it right now. Um, that was my inside words getting out. Laura talks to me about that all the time. Uh, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about this. You ever feel used around church? Sure you do. Taken advantage of, you know? When you feel used and taken advantage of, give them, the, give them your prayers. You say, Mike, that's the most illogical thing I've ever heard in my life. This is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 27. What did he say? Pray for those who mistreat you. When's the last time you did that? He didn't say slander those who mistreat you. Plot revenge on those who mistreat you. Post something really mean about them on social media when they mistreat you. He didn't, he didn't say that. He said when they mistreat you, pray for them. I'll tell you why. And this is what I've learned the hard way. It is almost impossible to pray for someone and at the same time remain hostile toward them. I challenge you. Who in your life is under your skin? I promise you, if you start praying for them, your attitude toward them will change. But don't just give your prayers. Sometimes you could give acts of kindness. Is a relationship broken down somewhere? You know, give them an act of kindness. Go slowly. You don't want them to freak them out because they're not used to you acting like that. But, you know, I'm going to give you an example of this and I'm going to let you go. Recently, we, we were in a situation where someone uh, just really just came unglued at Laura. It's not someone from our church. And they were just very, very angry and uh, hostile. And I remember one day I was working in the yard and, and this lady came by our house and Laura was at the front door. And she, I, all I could see, her hands were moving and the spit was flying everywhere. And Laura's just standing there. And, and I'm like, they're going to throw down. This is awesome. I'm going to have my camera out, you know. And, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, it didn't come to that. And, uh, <laughs> and I went in and Laura was crying and, and she, she sent a card. She, she went to the house, but the lady responded, I know you were at my door, but I didn't come to the door. So Laura responded to her email, and I read the email before Laura sent it. It said, I don't know what happened. I am so sorry. I don't know what, what impression you got, da 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 da, da. And, she, and basically the response is, I'll, I'll never forgive you. And Laura's like, I, I got to do something first. But, you know, and then Laura sent her flowers, you know. And then one day Laura came home. It was Friday, and I was home working in my office, and she said, uh, Guess who I ran into at Target? And I could just see it. You know, you come around the corner, you got the two big loaded carts facing one another. You know, hear the music from an old Western. Doo -doo 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 -doo. You know, and what's going to happen? And the other person said, I am so sorry. I don't know how this ever happened. Would you please forgive me? And can we hug? And Laura says, she came and she hugged me. And then we talked a while and we hugged again. And she, she says, we're, we're, we're good. And I really believe that was made possible because Laura, this was not a Christian at the time. Laura would not give up on the relationship. And I can't tell you how many times she said, honey, what if, what if this person doesn't become a Christian because of what she thinks of me? But I really believe her taking the high road and doing the right thing and was able to salvage and, and keep that relationship Maybe there's somebody around here that you just need to, you need to give an act of kindness to. Let me just ask you, can you imagine the example we would be the world, to the world if, if, 
if we had this kind of unity? Can you imagine? Jesus, Jesus said this, John 13, 35. They will know you're my disciples if you have a fish on your car. Mm -mm. <laughs> if you have a really cool bumper sticker like honk if you love Jesus. Mm -mm. If you fight and compete and compare with one another. No. Nope. He'll say they'll know if you love one another. Because when we love one another, the people in the world see the unity, and they're like, I don't get it, but I'm interested in what they've got. I'm interested. I love what Psalm 133 verse 1 says this, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Now, tonight is family night, vision night, 430 tailgating, bring your cornhole boards and footballs and I'm going to bring a cigar, offer up a burnt offering and, uh, right before we come in, very spiritual, and um, bring your fried chicken or grill, whatever you're going to do, I don't care. But we're just going to, wouldn't it be cool just to get together and hang out and get to know some new people? You know, if you see a group of people, just go with them. You don't know them, just go, if you see me, just come hang out. It doesn't matter to me. And then we're going to come in here about six, and we're going to have some of the most incredible worship. I'm just kind of cutting the team loose tonight, like, do it, baby. And uh, I've asked Trey to do a special song. Little James Taylor, but it's, it's going to be cool. You want to be here. And then uh, uh, we're going to talk about where God's leading us. You're going to meet some brand new staff. See, in a big church like this, it's hard, but we got some of the coolest new staffs with some of the newest ministries, opportunities that you need to be aware of. We're going to update you on the Apex campus. And I'm just going to share with you for a few minutes uh, just a couple of things that God has really passionately laid on my heart about how we as a church begin to do church differently. And I'd love to have you guys to be a part of it. Next week at each of our campuses, we're going to be talking about what would it look like as we begin to be unleashed out of this building and we begin to impact our own communities. What's our strategy for each of our campuses and what does that look like? And I'll just tell you, I'm excited about where God is taking us. And as I love to pray all the time, God, let us do something so great for you that it's absolutely doomed to fail if you don't show up. We want to make sure he gets all the credit and all the glory. So do me a favor, come out tonight. We're going to have a great time together. Keep you for about an hour and 15 minutes. And I think you'll go home. I think you'll go home encouraged about what God's doing here at Hope Community Church. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your love to us. And that while we were yet sinners, while we were actually your enemies fighting against you, no desire to be in a relationship with you, you gave us your only begotten son to die for us. And I remember Jesus praying to you. May, may they be one. May my followers be one, Father, as you and I are one. Father, teach us the power of oneness. I love what Paul said as he wrote to the churches. There's neither Jew nor Greek nor, fre nor, nor slave nor free man. nor man or woman. They're Scythians or barbarians. They're all one family. Unity. Give us a passion to be that kind of church so that we can provide that kind of unconditional family, accepting people where they are, loving people where they are, and encouraging them to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. That's our goal. And Father, when we get there, we'll give you the glory. In your name we pray, amen.